I'm, I recently, as in like this week or last week, reached 100 followers. So thank you so much to everyone who follows me. I really appreciate it whether you are a friend who follows me or whether you are a stranger who follows me. I hope we can be friends and I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone who supports my channel and who supports my love of making these videos. So I really, really appreciate it. I did shout outs in my last video, which was my booktube birthday because coincidentally, I reached 100 followers right around my one year booktube birthday, which was super special and just made both events very special. I wanted to mention a few people that I didn't mention in that. Summer at Cozy Reading with Quaker Cats. She has a great channel and she has lots of cats and she posts lots of cats on her Instagram, which I love. And we've been chatting more and buddy reading which is super super fun. I also want to mention Stephen Elliott Wilson who I know from way back in Brooklyn when we both bartended and he often comments like on Instagram he'll comment about something or he'll mention a video and it just means a lot to me. He also has a really great Instagram with so many pictures of like animals and spiders and frogs so I love to see his stories and his Instagram and follow kind of his nature journey. For 100 followers I wanted to do a Q&A so I asked on my channel and I asked on Instagram for people to leave me some questions so I have some questions here and then I have a couple of questions that nobody actually asked me but I feel like I get asked a lot so I was just gonna throw them in but I also wanted to talk a minute about numbers I'm super happy to reach this milestone and I do obviously want my channel to grow. I want more people to watch my videos. I want more people that I'm able to draw into my community. I want to create a community, um, not just for myself, but for the people in it. So the more people we have, the more channels there are to watch, the more Instagrams there are to see, the more people with more experiences there are to share, which is so great. I definitely think that YouTube and Instagram like lean you towards numbers that like getting those numbers up there is not only desired but rewarded. Of course we all know on YouTube and once you reach a thousand subscribers and four thousand hours of watch time you get monetized so you know obviously that's a goal that's like it's not a bad wish Do doesn't everyone on YouTube wish that they get monetized doesn't everyone who enjoys making videos wish that they could make money making those videos as well and have more time and space to make those videos I think we do I think it's very important important though not to get like bogged down in that idea and not to compare yourselves to other people's numbers, not to make that the focus. It's more about making the connections and making sure that as my channel is growing, I'm also learning and I'm also enjoying the videos that I'm making, and that I'm learning to be better at videos, that I'm coming up with new video ideas, that I'm just trying things out and having a fun time. And right now it's super fun and I really, really enjoy it. And I'm super happy to be making videos and I'm super happy to be learning things and trying new things. And some things work and some things don't. Some of my least viewed videos are the ones that I think are the most important to make. I think it's important to enjoy your time making the videos. Enjoy your time interacting with the people that you have. Enjoy learning about other people's lives through YouTube, through BookTube. Enjoy the books you're reading. Don't read for the numbers. Read because you love it and you know it's kind of a if you make it they will come kind of scenario. Not to bring baseball into everything all the time but work on it and do a good job and enjoy it and put your heart into it and people will see that and they'll respond. I hope that's true. That's how it feels to me. And so I just kind of wanted to say that about numbers. So the two questions that no one asked me, but I think are worth mentioning here are why the name of my channel is a little bit weird. Obviously, when you see my channel on your sidebar in YouTube, it's just my name on a motion. That's my name. That's kind of self explanatory. But on my videos and on my header, I have Mad Cat Quilts as well. So sometimes I refer to my channel as Mad Cat Quilts. And sometimes I refer to it as my name. I chose the name Man Cat Quilts for my blog many many years ago. I have a huge backlist of blog posts and 
Zero Waste is on there and reading is on there and day-to-day -day stuff. I also do a regular series of like my garden. I do regular series of plants in my area. I do regular series on art and travel. I chose Mad Cat Quilts because at the time I was quilting a lot and that was something I was really, really into. And I still do quilt occasionally. I hand quilt so it's very time consuming and it is like a mental process as well. I I still do identify as a quilter and I still do identify with that. It's something that, although I haven't done it very much in the last couple of years, I would love to get back to. So Mad Cat Quilts made sense. The quilts part, that's easy. The Mad Cat was named after my cat Bippy, who has since passed away, but she was a little bit angry and a little bit crazy, so she was a mad cat. And now I have Irving, who is another mad cat. He's sitting on the table right here, you can't see him, but he is also a little bit angry and a little bit crazy. I continually have some mad cats in my life, so mad cat quilts just kind of works. And that's kind of my channel name and where that originated from, and it's definitely my blog name. The other question that I get asked a lot is what my name is, where my name came from. I always refer to myself as Mo, even though my first name is Anna, and that is because that's how it's been my whole life. No one's ever called me Anna, but my parents did name me that, that is my name. My name origin story is that I was born at home, and while I was in utero, they didn't know if I was gonna be a boy or a girl, so they started calling me a neutral name, and that name was Mo. They also had picked out names if I was gonna be a boy or a girl. They had those kind of in the back of their head, but they always called me Mo. And then after I was born, they named me the girl name, which was Anna, which I don't exactly know the origins of that name. I do know that there's some like ancient connection to like a goddess or something, but I don't know exactly which one. I don't know exactly where it came from. I don't know if it was just something that they liked. It is spelled A-N-A, -A, which some people say as Anna, but it is pronounced, the way my parents pronounce it is Anna. They named me that name, but then they just called me Mo. So on my birth certificate, it does say Anna Mo. And I think that I'm glad that they didn't name me the other way around because then my name would be Mo Anna and that would be weird. My friends know these stories already, by the way. So that is where I got my weird name. On to the questions that people ask me. These are like in no particular order and I will link everyone who can be linked down below and I'll just mention them here. So let's do all non-book questions first and then book questions after. Question number one is what is your favorite meal? And Summer asked me that one. I haven't thought of the answers to any of these questions. I've had these questions for like a week, but I haven't thought of any of the answers to them. And I think my favorite meal is pasta. I definitely love pasta. I eat pasta all the time. I like fresh pasta, good pasta, homemade pasta. I like stuffed pasta. I like store-bought pasta. I like it with red sauce. I like it with garlic and olive oil. I like it with white sauce. I think that has to be like my favorite meal and my most consumed meal probably. I also really love pizza. Pizza's delicious. The next question kind of goes along with that. What is your favorite recipe that you like to cook? And that was asked by Michelle. My favorite recipe that I like to cook might be pasta too because it's so easy and it's not like an elaborate recipe but I like to make my own sauce and I like that you can add different things to it. I like that you can make it vegan. I like that you cannot make it vegan. I also actually really like making soups. My go-to soup is just a whatever vegetables you have to use up creamy vegan soup and then serve that with like some really good crusty bread. Most of the recipes that I'm mentioning are actually in my blog. There's a recipe section so you can go and check some of the actual recipes out if you want. Noah asked what my favorite coffee, both like the origin and the roast, and what my favorite drink is to drink. And that makes sense because Noah loves coffee <laughs> and they're a coffee guru. My favorite roast is definitely a light roast. I love a light roast coffee. I usually get Sumatra because I think that's the most common light roast coffee. The coffee shop that I work at has a really good light roast Sumatra that I brew at home. And I think my favorite drink is just my morning coffee. It's just coffee that I brew at home, I use a pour over or sometimes a french press. It just has rice milk which is my milk of choice but if I'm like going for a fancy coffee 
probably a really well-made cappuccino is delicious. I like to put a little sugar in the bottom, like crunchy sugar, and then at the very last you get that like crunchy sugary bite, which is so tasty. For fancy, fancy coffee, I think I would go for the mocha. Especially good mocha has that like rich, dark chocolate, but it's nice and sweet. And then the coffee flavors that just mix so well with chocolate and then a nice creamy like oat milk. I'm coming around to soy in espresso. I think soy milk has come like a long way in my lifetime. When my mom used to drink soy milk when I was little, it was like, not good, especially in coffee, but I've been drinking soy lattes at work and my friend Avery said, come visit me in Florida. So not a question, but one day, one day I do want to come. The pictures of the cousins um, in the pool made me very jealous. So one day I will come and visit you. A subscriber, and I am not entirely sure how to pronounce her handle, but it kind of looks like the Elizabeth asked me if I was a New Jersey native. I am a New Jersey native. Right after I was born, my parents moved to New Mexico very, very briefly and lived in Abiquiu, New Mexico. So technically I've lived there, but not really. We moved back to New Jersey. We've moved several different places, but the majority of my life has been spent in the county which I currently live, which is Monmouth County. Monmouth County is right in the kind of middle of the state of New Jersey, and it's on the Jersey Shore, which is why we're not considered Central Jersey. We're considered Jersey Shore. We're not North Jersey, and we're not South Jersey. We're right in the middle but it stretches almost the whole way across the state and there's just so many amazing things here you have the ocean you have lakes you have farmland and some like kind of rolling hills we have racetracks we have malls uh, we have some amazing parks we have a lot of history here we have a lot of battlegrounds and different places where historic events happen, which is really cool. And I'm happy to live here again. I did spend 15 years living in Brooklyn. I think if I hadn't come back to New Jersey, I would always call myself a Brooklynite, but I did come back to New Jersey. So, I mean, I'll, I'll always be a New Jerseyan, of course. And she also asked me if I was homeschooled because I did mention that briefly as one of the things that people might want to ask me about. And I was homeschooled. Both my parents went to teaching college and my mother homeschooled me from, you know, infancy basically until I was about eight and a half. From eight and a half to nine, I was enrolled part-time in a private alternative school. Then from nine to 14, I went full-time to that school. That was the longest period I was in like full-time school. I mean, that school only went up to 14. So I did briefly go to a public high school. I went to public high school for two years, but I really hated it. And I did not get on with the teaching style, especially after having such really amazing and wonderful teachers and having so much time for self-guided learning. I really couldn't get the hang of public school. So what I did was I dropped out of high school and I went to college. I took early college classes at first and as soon as I was old enough to take full-on college courses, I just matriculated into my local community college. And so then I was probably in some form of college for the next like six or seven years. I never actually finished college and I didn't graduate. Um, I did move to New York with the intent of finishing college. So while I was taking college courses uh, just out of high school and while I was figuring out how to matriculate into college. I was also doing self-guided learning and homeschooling as well. So I got a lot of learning in, in those two years that I was supposed to be in high school, but I was actually in college already. And I have a lot of thoughts on homeschooling. I think it was a, an amazing experience. If anyone wants to know more about my homeschooling journey or more details about how I was homeschooled and what I learned and how important it is to me, definitely feel free to ask in the comments below. I would love to talk about it more. It's a subject that I feel very passionately about. Trevor, who is also a great supporter of my channel, he also is a person who contacts me via Instagram and lets me know that he's seen my videos and he was the first person to answer these questions, so thank you so much. Asked, if I'm reading something and I'm not really into it, do I stop or do I just slog through? So I used to, without fail, slog through. I like never DNF'd a book. Even like books that I hated, like Twilight. I didn't read all three books, obviously, because it was horrible. I only read the first book, but I hate-readed like 
75% of that book. But now I'm not into hate reading and I'm not into slogging through and I'm definitely into DNFing. I think that a lot of times the books that I do end up DNFing, I will come back to at some point and I do want to finish. I think prior to booktube, if I went into a reading slump, I would go into a reading slump for months or year or years and I didn't know that you could just not do that. <laughs> or I didn't think you could just not do that. So now that I know that, no reading slumps for me. I'm going to try to read books that are engaging and captivating and interesting to me and that I get along well with. And if I don't, I'm gonna put them down. I don't just slog through them anymore though, I put them down. And then his kind of follow-up question was, what's a deal breaker that makes you stop reading a book? This hasn't happened yet, but it comes very close to happening sometimes. And a deal breaker that makes me stop reading a book is violence, and especially violence towards animals. I really just empathize and sympathize so hard that I cannot stomach reading it on the page. One of the books that I read in October had some animal violence and there was a part where you're kind of let in that a dog dies and if that dog had died in a gruesome way I would have stopped the book there. Like if it was a malicious attack against animals I would have stopped the book there and I wouldn't have read it anymore. Like I said that to myself in my mind. That, that also is a deal breaker for me for TV and movies. Sometimes violence, and especially violence towards women, depending on how it's depicted, will make me pause in a book and, and think if I really want to continue reading it. But generally I kind of stay away from books like that. There are some books that I've read, I've read some horror books, I've read Silence of the Lambs, they're obviously going to have murders in them, they're going to be gruesome, they're going to be bloody, and I think if I'm mentally prepared for that, that's one thing, but sometimes there are things that are too realistic. I think in contemporary fiction, in literary fiction, I think other than that, maybe too much sex in a book. Again, it, it depends on the context because I've read romances, steamy books, you know, I'm not like a huge smut reader, but like I could see it if I pick up a smut book, like there's gonna be smut in it, there's gonna be some sex. If I've heard that a book is like way, way too sexual, or if I've heard that a book has animal violence, like Bunny by Mona Wad, I'm super interested in Bunny, but I don't think I could read it because of the animal violence. Those are like my deal breakers. Mostly the animal violence, sometimes people violence, occasionally other things. Noah also asked if I've ever been into reading ebooks, and no, I've actually never read an ebook. I don't have an e reader and I don't have an iPad, so I would have to read it on my phone or the computer, which doesn't make sense to me because if I'm gonna read it on the phone or the computer, I'd rather just have the physical book. I'm a physical book person, like, I like to listen to audiobooks, but reading a book to me is just a special experience. Finding old books and finding vintage copies, frayed edges or people writing in the book or annotating. Like I love that physical presence of the people who have read it before since the majority of my books, I mean almost every single one of my books is second hand. You know there's always the presence of other people having touched and manipulated and enjoyed this physical object. Let me know, Noah, if you like reading ebooks because I know that you are very much a person who reads physical books and that you like to go to bookstores. So I would be really interested to know if you've been reading ebooks, especially while you've been in Hawaii. The last question was from Michelle again, and that is if I had a book that doesn't get talked about a lot that, or books that don't get talked about a lot that everyone should read and what would those be? Some books that I would recommend, I haven't seen seen people talking about that I think are relevant and important and that people should read for the idea of self 
improvement and improvement of the world is maybe The Good Life by Scott and Helen Meering and some of those early pioneer people, pioneer hippies, not early like pioneers like early early but like in the 60s, the, the Nearings were from like the 30s to the 70s, from like the 60s. There are some now, I don't like their writing as much, the ones that I've read. Scott and Helen Nearing's The Good Life is all about how to create the world that you want to live in. So a world where it's not monetary based, a world where you can grow your own food, a world where you can share with your neighbors, a world where your skills and labor are traded for other people's skills and labor, a world where you live in a community that helps each other and helps people outside of their community. I think books like that are under read and what's the word? Not really transferred to now. Scott and Helen Neering moving to Vermont and creating this kind of diplomatic utopia within their little group of people where they would sit down with their family and make every decision in a in a diplomatic and balanced way is not necessarily something that can happen in today's world unless you want to move off grid unless you want to totally change your lifestyle but i think that there's a lot of ideas and a lot of themes that we could take from that and no matter where you live if you live in a high rise in the city if you live in a urban community like I do, if you live in a suburban community, if you live in a rural community, that you could incorporate into your life. And I think victory gardens and low waste and low impact all have to do with that. Scott and Helen Neering didn't have to worry about low waste. There were no plastic bottles that they had to avoid. There were no things that were so convenient but destroying the planet in the same way that there are now. Things have progressed so rapidly from the time that they moved to Vermont to now that those are the things that we need to be worrying about. Not many of us are going to build a stone house or a log cabin like Anne LaBastille in The Woods Woman. Not many of us are gonna do that, but what we can do is build raised garden beds instead of lawns and provide food for our families or for neighbors. I think there are a lot of ways to gather your community around you or to utilize things that already exist. There's potential to do a lot of the pioneering that they did on a scale and in a system that would work today. So I think that those are books that I think everyone should read and I think everyone should incorporate. I think the themes of low impact, the themes of zero waste, the themes of community are like things that people should be connecting more with now than ever, more than ever. As far as fiction or just favorite books, what comes to mind is The Island of Dr. Moreau, which I've talked about a lot this year and I reread earlier in the year. And I think if you're not into classics, that's a great classic. If you're not into sci-fi, that's a great sci-fi. If you're not into allegorical writing, that's a good one. It has a lot of lessons, but it's also thrilling. It's adventurous. It's interesting. Obviously, that's a well-loved classic book, but I think that would be a book. If you haven't read it, you should read it. Those were all the questions. Again, thank you so much for 100 followers. Thank you so much for supporting my channel. I appreciate it so much. If you have follow-ups to any of these questions, if you have other questions that you thought of while watching this video, definitely leave them in the comments below and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks so much. Bye.